it's terrific to be with you here today and pass on some thoughts about the global environment uh, that you operate in, in fact, uh, the entire world operates in. Uh, I had the fortunate pleasure uh, when I was the Commandant of the Coast Guard to produce the first unified uh, sea power strategy with the Commandant of the Marine Corps and the Chief of Naval Operations, which we able to roll out an international forum in Newport, uh, Rhode Island, uh, back around 2008-2009. In my remarks then, I noted that the science fiction art author, uh, Arthur C. Clarke, who wrote Space Odyssey 2001, probably all remember that, had an interesting quote. He said, if you looked at this planet from space, you wouldn't call it Earth because it's obviously ocean. And if you think about uh, the evolution of this world and man's place on it, and what the maritime environment has meant to the evolution of man, uh, it's pretty extraordinary. Uh, the only reason I bring that up to start my remarks is there seems to be a lot of talk these days about uh, globalization. Is it good? Is it bad? Uh, how do we cope with it? I think we saw some indications of that in the uh, European Union elections that took place uh, this last Sunday. Uh, but I would tell you this, uh, after having spent almost 40 years in the Coast Guard and having spent 10 years beyond that working in and out of the private sector and not-for-profits and advisory roles with the uh, U.S. government. Uh, it's not a matter of if globalism. If globalism exists, it's going to continue. As I told a group earlier today, the universe is expanding. It doesn't go in reverse. There's no check out. Uh, and we can continue to see things change, driven mostly by technology. Uh, the extraordinary pace of technology is causing changes that defy borders and boundaries, that defy political parties, and whether you're a populist uh, from the Green Party or whatever, uh, that globalism is going to continue. We all know that uh, capital seeks the lowest labor costs. You're seeing that in the shipping industry and how you're crewing your ships. Uh, these are trends that will continue. Moreover, uh, the rapid advance of technology in the world has created a technical complexity we haven't seen before. So we're looking at challenges uh, that sometimes outpace our ability to come up with standard operating procedures, legal doctrines, uh, training tactics. The way we do our business every day is being challenged by rapid advances in technology that are giving us problems we've never seen before. And associated with that is, in my view, a fundamental redefinition of what a border is in this world. Uh, after the Treaty of Westphalia and the Hundred Years' War, uh, we decided that if you were a nation state and you could draw a line on a map and you could defend it and exert sovereignty, uh, that defined you as a nation state. Uh, and while some of that remains true, uh, our borders and how we actually operate in this world are becoming far more complex. And we're starting to see uh, not a movement away, but in addition to a geographically and a functionally uh, described border, I mean a geographically and physically described border, what I would call a functional border, uh, my classic, uh, the classic example I use, which I made up, but I think it's pretty close to being true, is a young container full of light bulbs leaves Romania and goes to Omaha, Nebraska. Uh, that container may never be opened, but the United States exerts its sovereignty by analyzing all the data associated with the uh, transportation platforms, shippers, cargoes, freight forwarders, and so forth. And that's all done through data analytics and algorithms that are written. Uh, to detect trends and uh, potential threats to the country. So we're having to use technology in order for us to facilitate trade and have shipping commerce actually uh, go at the pace it needs to with the supply chains that exist in the world. In addition to that, we have a number of threats that are agnostic to physical borders. We're finding out that that's more challenging and problematic as well. Uh, the weather, uh, we found out through the Ebola crisis, germs, there are new methods of transition, of transmission of these threats, and we need to be mindful of that. And the mandate that that's creating is to think about globalism as something that's an evolutionary thing that's going to take place, whether politicians believe it is or not. And how do we really think about that strategically and how we position ourselves? You know, it's a big issue right now with the 2020 sulfur guidelines. Uh, you know, we've been dealing with heavy sulfur fields for quite a while. And you can see how technically hard it is 
to govern these things. Uh, I was dealing with a ballast water issue uh, when I was a junior captain of the Coast Guard 20 years ago. And we're still not there yet. So in my view, as we look forward, the issue is, are we going to harness technology to solve these problems? Uh, are we going to compete against political pressures to push us towards populist positions and try to reinforce physically and geographically described borders? Are we going to understand that this is an evolution and this planet will continue to move out in space and spin every day, whether our human beings are on it or not? And how do we th think we should be part of that and how can we best uh, protect the interests of humanity? Uh, as I said to a group earlier this week, there are only three supply chains on Earth that matter. And it's air, water, and food. And the Earth is going to create the delimiters of globalization. And ultimately we're going to find out the limits of globalization lie in our ability to husband the resources this planet's provided us to be able to then put those to the best use of mankind. Uh, I'm pretty hopeful about the future because the technology it's in our grasp is pretty extraordinary. Uh, but while it's extraordinary, it's also difficult in two regards. Uh, and I speak from a, as a former government, government official, a former regulator, the two challenges with advancing technology in the maritime environment. One is how do you acquire that technology and deploy it for mission execution? So the United States Coast Guard has a, has a cyber strategy. It starts with protecting its own networks. And then how do you actually conduct operations in that type of environment and how do you correct, uh, uh, protect the critical infrastructure? Well, the dual challenge is to be able to acquire this technology and actually use it. The other one is how do you conduct oversight and render it? Which means you have to have the capability, capacity, and competency uh, to be able to do that. Uh, and sometimes I feel we're in stern chase. Uh, technology's out there and we can see it on the horizon. Uh, but sometimes I fear with the rapid advance of technology that we're experiencing these days that that stern chase is widening. Uh, I think the answer in the future is going to have to be more uh, government and private sector cooperation. Uh, most of the problems we face today are not going to be solved through rulemaking. It takes 10 or 15 years, in some cases 20 years if you look at ballast water. Uh, and that means uh, co-production of outcomes uh, to meet these complex problems. That's only going to be done when we have forums like this where folks can get together, exchange views, talk about what's important. But I think in the end, it's going to be the ability for everybody to understand that uh, globalization will continue. It started with the age of exploration and moved on through the colonial period. It will continue. The question is, will it be to the benefit of uh, mankind or will it cause more problems? And threaten the existence of human beings on the earth because of the climate change and everything else. Uh, and speaking of climate change, I guess I'll make one personal observation before I get off the stage here. I was <laughs> I was testifying on the hill one, one time as a commandant, and I had a U.S. senior look over the top of his glasses at me. He said, "Am I Allen? What's your opinion on global warming?" Like I was going to touch that question in here, but I looked at him and I said. Sir, at this point, I'm agnostic to the science as water where there didn't used to be, and I'm responsible for it. And I think what we need to understand, there's water all over the surface, 70% of it, and uh, we're all responsible for it. So thank you.